know, I tried to be someone else one time, and I couldn't be. And when I was trying to be someone else, I wasn't myself either, so I wasn't nobody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what the heck? So, 2 Corinthians 2, verses 6 to 11. Oh, we'll have to edit that out on, on, the, on the video. All right, praise the Lord. And I'm going to read this from the Eng, uh, English Standard Version because it's it's really kind of hard to understand in King James, but I'm going, to, I'm going to read it from the English Standard. Now, if anyone has caused pain, Paul's talking, he's writing. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has not caused it, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his devices. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Would you pray with me, please, for the remainder part of the service and for the message. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity and privilege to come before you and proclaim your word. Lord, we ask that you would anoint us in pulpit and in pew, the pour of your spirit upon us. Lord, we ask that you would just come in and drop a Holy Ghost bomb in this place, that you would move in a mighty way by your spirit, that you would move on upon us, your people, that we might love you in a better way, that we might be touched by you. Send a revival, Lord, and let it start here in this pulpit, and let it spread, Lord, and let it just go all over the world, that your name might be glorified. Move by your Spirit in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to focus on the phrase that Paul says, we are not ignorant of his devices. His meaning Satan. We are not ignorant of his devices. The title of my message, and I got this a few weeks ago. I thought, where am I going to go with this? But the Lord gave it to me. It's called The Devil in the isms. The devil in the isms. And in the King James Version, it says we are not ignorant of his devices. And the English Standard transfers of designs. So I looked up that word in the Greek, in the actual Greek uh, translation. And it is a Greek word, niama, or niama, sorry, niama. And it means a purpose, and specifically an evil purpose. So Paul is saying, I don't want you to be ignorant of Satan's evil purposes. I want you to forgive this man and move on in love and comfort because we don't want Satan to trip us up over this, okay? Evil is always Satan's purpose. And it was well established in the Corinthian church. Paul had personally founded the church of Corinth on his second missionary journey. Corinth was an old city. It was very prominent and influential in ancient Greece, in Greek, Greek politics, and Greek history, and also became a very important city under the Roman occupation and rule, which is the time that this letter was written when Rome, Rome was ruling. Corinth was a city that was filled with idols, to the so-called Greek and Roman gods and so-called goddesses. The most famous was the temple of Ap Ap Aphrodite, the temple of Aphrodite that employed 1,000 prostitutes, and they, they, people, they were called temple prostitutes. And it was an evil city, and it caused Paul some of his greatest challenges in dealing with these Corinthian converts to Christianity because they've been so steeped in idolatry and hedonism and paganism and immorality. So he had a lot of issues to deal with, but he still called them his brothers and sisters. And he wrote this letter, 
who is referring to an individual that he wrote to them about in his first letter. This individual had been sinning by sleeping with his stepmother. And Paul told them to actually to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 5.5 5. In our text, Paul is encouraging the church to forgive this man and love him. And then he writes in verses 10 and 11, Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his purposes or designs. Paul was informing the church that the reason they should forgive and love this man, this formerly sinful brother, is because it's the right thing to do, and it's the right thing to do because Jesus said it's the right thing to do. Amen? Amen. Jesus commanded, he said, if Forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Mark 11, verse 25. Paul knew that if this incident was not handled properly in God's way, that Satan would use it to hinder God's work in the Corinthian local church. You see, the main target of Satan's attack is always the gospel. So he knows that if he can sow discord in the church, then he can bring dishonor on the gospel. If we are to be successful as individual Christians, and if we are to be successful as a local church, we have to educate ourselves about Satan's evil purposes. As Paul says, we are not to be ignorant of his designs, and I want to make a start on that effort by talking about Satan's work in the world and specifically his influence in and through the isms of this world. As my message is, the devil in the isms. I want us to learn about his working in, in three isoisms. There's so many, but egoism, globalism, and right under that, communism. The first thing to know about the devil is that he is God's devil. He is God's devil. That's where an amen goes, right in there. Because he is a created being, created by God as an angel. He was created as a special type of angelic being called a cherub. And that's from the Hebrew word, and I'm not going to pronounce this right, keruv which means ranking or flanking God's throne. Flanking God's throne. You know, in the, in the Ark of the Covenant, in the mercy seat, there are two cherubs over top of the mercy seat. Satan was created as a cherub. He is neither God nor human. He is a fallen, renegade angel. God named him Lucifer, which is from the Hebrew word Haleo. And that means light bearer. That's from Isaiah 14, verse 12. But you see, he forgot that he belonged to God. He forgot that he was God's creature. This lapse of his memory is described in Ezekiel, the 28th chapter, verses 13 through 15 and verse 17. Thou hast been, talking about Satan, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond. The beryl, the onyx, and the jasper. The sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workman of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in you in the day that you were created. You are the anointed cherub that covers. And I have set thee so. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. Then verse 17. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. I will cast you down to the ground I will lay you before kings 
that they may behold you. Notice, he was created. And he was so beautiful that he literally shined from all the precious stones that were on him. All those diamonds and emeralds and sapphires and rubies. And music projected from him. I can't tell you. I played music as for a living for 13 years. And I can't tell you how many people, when I was a sinner, that we just openly talked about the fact that they sold their souls to the devil. And then they died horrible deaths, usually of a drug overdose. But Satan was literally like a heavenly pipe organ. It, those pipes and tablets or timbrels, those were music, that was talking about music. And music literally exuded from him when he walked. My first point is egoism. Egoism. You see what happened? He was so beautiful. And he was so spectacular, he forgot an iniquity is found in him. Forgot he was created. You see, the definition of egoism is the habit of valuing everything only in reference to one's personal interest, selfishness. Egoism can be thought of as selfism, the belief that you should act only in your own best interests and desires. This is the devil personified. He only acts in his own best interests and desires. He was the cherub that covered, meaning that he was right up by the throne of God. He was given a free will, but because of his beauty and his special attributes and his view of himself as being so exceptional and so superior, his ego got so massive that he thought he could overthrow God. His coup attempt is described, against God is described in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14. Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? Listen. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will set also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Five I wills. Egoism. But you see what happened? He wanted to be like God, and even more, he wanted to be God. But instead, what happened? God cut him down to the ground. Amen? Amen. And he is still God's devil. Everything he does, or any power that he has, is only that which is permitted by God. But God is not the author of or the approver, uh, approval of, approver of his evil. <clears throat> Yet, in the end of time, even the devil's workings will be seen as having accomplished the will of God. We don't understand it now. But in the end of time, we're going to see that everything that God either ordained or permitted, even the workings of the devil, were actually accomplishing the will of God. Know this, Satan is the supreme egotist. He's full of vanity and selfishness, a false of sense of self-importance, and everything is about him. That is egoism. Amen. And it is the devil's primary character trait, egoism. He's getting mad at this message. I don't care. The devil's mad and I'm glad. Hallelujah. In his book, Jihadist Psychopath, which I have, the author, Jamie Glazol, says this, Lucifer desires to be God, but he cannot be God. While he grasps this eternal truth on some levels, he cannot accept it. This admixture of pride and denial 
sparks within him an indistinguishable rage and hatred. And in turn, or sorry, inextinguishable rage and hatred. And in turn, the desire to pervert and destroy all of God's creation, end quote. He wanted God's place in the universe. He wanted God's prestige. The respect and honor that God was giving, he wanted for himself. He has not changed. He still wants to be worshipped as God is worshipped. All because of his supreme egoism. Friends, he even wanted Jesus to worship him after Jesus came to this earth. Remember how he came to tempt our Lord three times after the Lord had went into the wilderness and fasted for 40 days? And it was and it was the devil's, this was the devil's third attempt. To try to get Jesus to worship him. Let me read it to you. Again the devil took him up into an exceeding high mountain. And showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And the glory of them. And said unto him. All these things will I give you. If you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him. Get thee behind me Satan. Away with you. Get out of here. Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and angels came and ministered to him. Matthew 4, verses 8 through 11. We have to remember that the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. The kingdoms were not his to give. Because the word of God says, all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted above head as above, head over, head above all. In 2 Chronicles. It belongs to Jesus, not the devil. For by him, Jesus, all things were created. That are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and by Him all things are held together. Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17. Amen. We have to remember that the devil is a liar. And, and you know what? Even if, which it's not possible, but let's just hypothetically say, even if he did have the power to give the kingdoms to Jesus, he wouldn't have done it because he's a liar. <laughs> he's a liar. He wouldn't have done it anyway, even if he could. But you can't. But if he could, he wouldn't have because he is a liar. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm loving it. My next point, so the devil is in the ism of egoism. My next point is globalism. Globalism. And I, I got to think, people are going to think, Brother Pruitt, why are you going to globalism? Where's that in the Bible? Well, it's in the Bible. Why go to globalism to attribute this ism to the devil? Let me explain. After the world had become so evil that God had to send a worldwide flood and destroy everyone on the earth except Noah and his family as described in Genesis chapters 6 through 8 destroying all human life after that the world began to repopulate in Genesis 9 we learned that the earth was re-inhabited through the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and of course through their wives. And the Bible says that Noah lived for 350 years after the flood and died at age 950. Genesis 10 then lists the generations that followed the sons of Noah. 
Ham, one of the sons, had a son named Cush. And Cush had a son named Nimrod. The Bible says that Nimrod was a mighty hunter and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. He also founded the ancient city of Nineveh. Just make them a point. Why globalism? Genesis chapter 11 begins with this. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. This was the beginning of globalism. The definition of globalism is a policy or outlook that is worldwide in scope. A policy of placing the interests of the entire world above those of individual nations. You see, the world was one at Babel. We next read that they came to the plain of Shinar and decided to all settle down there as one big, happy, one world family. They said this collectively, this is the word of God. Let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top shall reach to the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves lest we should be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. You see, God had told them to, to scatter abroad, to go over the whole earth. You see, staying in one place and being one big one world happy family was not God's will for them, for mankind. And any action that is contrary to God's will is of the devil. Amen. Here's what God said and did in response in Genesis 11. Verses 6 through 9. The Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing they pur propose to do will be withheld for them. Come, let us. Isn't that interesting? <coughs> us go down. The Lord said, Let us go down. Meaning the Trinity. Let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Reading on. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Genesis 11, verses 8 and 9. Now listen. Ever since the Tower of Babel, the devil has been trying to motivate people to act in opposition to the will of God. To once again build a new city and a new Tower of Babel that will reach to the heavens and become a one world global community, which is in rebellion to the will of God. The United Nations whose stated goal is to create a, quote, new world order, end quote, with a one world government, a one world military, a one world money system, and a one world uh, religion, is just one prominent example of the devil's attempt, the devil in the isms, the devil in the ism of globalism. And they are using Agenda 21 project, and their sustainable development program to try again make one world, which is an opposition to the will, the will of God. And the devil's going to try it again in the end of the last days of this earth. In the last three and a half years of the tribulation period through the Antichrist called the beast, as described in Revelation 13, 5-8, it says, He, the beast, was given authority to continue for 42 months. That's three and a half years. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell, listen, all who dwell in the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain before the foundation of the world. Globalism. Going to try to make us one big 
world under his he wants see he wants to rule the world that's what he's always wanted to do and he's if he gets all he's got to get all the world together to rule all the world you see the devil is in the ism of globalism and last the devil in the ism of communism before I get to the devil in the ism of communism I want to talk about the ism of socialism. Vladimir Lenin, the founder of the, of, in, of the international communism, said the goal of socialism is communism. That it is a necessary step toward communism. He was quoting Karl Marx, the father of communist philosophy, who wrote that socialism was, quote, a necessary stage in the development of communism, end quote. I have a book called The Politically Incorrect Guide to Socialism by Kevin D. Williamson. And he says, the socialists and communists among themselves acknowledge that socialism is not separate from communism. And that even the most hardened communists of the modern era, such as Soviet Russia, Red China, and North Korea, also routinely refer to their systems as socialism. I have another book by Paul Kingbore called The Politically Incorrect Guide to Communism. And he cites former President John F. Kennedy who says this about communism. He said, Kennedy said, Communism, communists allow no room for God. The claim of the state must be total and allow no other loyalty and no other philosophy of life can be tolerated, end quote. I don't think Karl Marx was an atheist. I think he believed in God, he just hated God. I'm reading two books, Marx and the Devil and, and Car the Devil and Karl Marx and Satan and Karl Marx. I can't remember the titles, I got two different books that I'm reading a little bit in. He wrote Satan-themed poetry as a young man. He was obsessed with and memorized long passages of the, the poem, uh, of of uh, Goethe. Goethe wrote a poem called uh, a, a play called Faust, where he called uh, where a demon named Mistopheles tempted Faust to sell his soul to the devil. I got that name right. Yeah, Faust. Goethe wrote this story called F about a man named Faust, and in that story, a demon tempted Faust to sell his soul to the devil. Marx was obsessed with that story. He, he, knew, he memorized long passages and could quote them. I read a book called Tortured for Christ by a man named Richard Wormbrand. I highly recommend that book. He was a Romanian pastor who served 14 years in prison under communist USSR when they took over <coughs> Romania. And this is a quote from his book. He said this. This will chill you. I have seen communists whose faces while torturing believers shone with rapturous joy. They cried out while torturing the Christians. We are the devil. One torturer said, I thank God in whom I don't believe that I have lived to this hour when I can express all the evil that is in my heart. End quote. Wormbrand states by his studies that Marx eventually became a Satan worshiper who regularly participated in occult practices and habits. What did Jesus say to the Jewish leaders in John 8, 44? Ye are of your father the devil and his works you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, Jesus said. Kingor in that book on communism, which is co-titled, undertitled, the killingest idea ever. Communism has directly led to the death of 140 to 160 million people worldwide just in the 20th century. That's more than Hitler, more than both world wars, and more than disease pand pandemics. Describing the devil as a thief, Jesus said the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy in John 10.10. 10. 
in the imitation of the devil, one of the goals of communism is to steal private property. I have the Communist Manifesto, and it's specifically stated by Marx and Engels this way in their Communist Manifesto. Quote, in this sense, the theory of the communists may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property, end quote. Jesus in 844 also called the devil a liar and the father of liars. Communism is built on lies. In fact, in communism, lying is a virtue. It teaches the lie of the political philosophy that mankind can ultimately create a heaven on earth. And the evil lie that Christianity is the greatest enemy of mankind when it's been the greatest blessing to mankind. But communism's greatest lie is that God is a liar. As the devil told Eve, the Garden of Eden, or even worse, the atheistic lie that God doesn't even exist. There are many other things I can talk about of the devil being in the isms, but it's going to have to be for another day. I want to end with this. The United States is under the attack of the devil. He is our enemy. Therefore, we must, that's why the Lord gave me this message, we must not be ignorant of his devices. Inspired by Satan, the Black Lives Matter organization, the anarchist group Antifa, the Youth Liberation Front and others, also being aided, I'm here to tell you, by the Chinese Communist government, are seeking to undermine our great republic. The entire intent of the Black Lives Matter movement is a Marxist communism intent. In an interview with the Real News Network, which you can listen to on the internet until they take it down, until our tech masters take it down for something you don't want to hear, but it's there on the Real News Network. BLM founder Patricia Cullors admits that she and her cohorts, cohorts are, quote, trained Marxists, end quote. She said this, quote, We actually do have an ideological frame. Myself and Alicia, that's Alicia Garza in particular, we're trained organizers. We're trained Marxists. We are super versed on ideological theories, end quote. That's who's marching through our streets, communists. Among their goals are, quote, disrupting the nuclear family structure, and they say they are a queer affirming network. In addition to doing away with the family, Black Lives Matter wants to abolish police, prisons, and capitalism. The Black Lives Matter's leaders have also threatened to, quote, burn down the system, end quote. You can hear that on a Fox News interview with uh, Martha McSally, I think. One of their leaders. We're going to burn it down if we don't get what we want. News broke just this week. I read it last night. That Black Lives Matter has recently partnered with the Chinese Progressive Association, which is a U.S. front group for the Chinese Communist Party. On September 12th of this year, 2020, listen up. A black street preacher was in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's just what? A week ago? He was attacked by a Black Lives Matter mob. It's awful to watch. He was shouting, Jesus saves! And the blood of Jesus! And you can see the Black Lives Matter mob marching through the street shouting, Black Lives Matter! And F your Jesus. Except they said A black teenager, you can see a black teenager walks up to this street preacher and punches him in the face. And then there's another black woman who's saying, that S don't matter. S blank, blank, blank don't matter. Meaning Jesus saves in the blood of Jesus. I will murder you, she says to this preacher. You can find that video at the Gateway Pundit. 
The devil is working in our streets. And what about Antifa? They were founded in, you know, the ones that are all black, all dressed alike, covered up so you can't see their faces. Of course, if you're watching CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, NBC, you won't even know that this is happening, hardly. No, it's mostly peaceful protests, although they're burning everything down in 20 major cities. Antifa was founded in 1932 by the Stalinist Communist Party of Germany. They are a revolutionary communist anarchist militia movement that aspires to forcibly overthrow the United States government and is responsible since March 2020 of this year, March 2020, along with other Satan-inspired groups for riots and arsons and murders in 20 major U.S. cities. You think our country's not under attack by the devil? The Lord's allowing it, but it's under attack by the devil. One of their major funders is the left-wing billionaire George Soros. It's plain the devil is in the e isms of egoism, globalism, and communism. I finished that message like that last night and the Lord said this morning, you can't leave them like that, Rusty. you got to give them some good news. <laughs> so I want to give you some good news. The ultimate end of the devil. And I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse, John said. And he said that he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in linen, uh, fine linen, white and clean, that's us. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And then verse 19, the end. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet, which deceived them who had taken the mark of the beast and that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's the end of the Antichrist, the false prophet. But guess what? In, in Revelation 20, verse 10, 10, guess who's going to join? The devil! The devil's going to join the, the beast and the false prophet in the lake of fire and brimstone. And they will be, the Bible says, tormented day and night forever. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah to the living God. That's the end of the devil. But we don't have to wait till the end to have victory over the devil. Jesus said, what did he say? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Right? Didn't he say that? In Matthew 24, 35. Didn't he say, I give you all power over the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Luke 10, 19. Didn't James say, submit yourself to, the de or to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There is no savior for the devil. But there is a savior for egotists and globalists and communists. There is even a savior for Black Lives Matter followers and Antifa and Youth Liberation and certain commentators on certain channels that we watch. I'll edit that out, maybe I don't know. <laughs> Thinking that you can't get saved is the greatest lie of the devil. Whatever anyone has done, Jesus, you're lit, if you got this far in this message, you're watching me on YouTube or, or Facebook or Twitter or BitChute or wherever, 
If the devil has told you you can't get saved, he's lied to you. Because he is a liar, remember. There's nothing Jesus can forget. Give. And if you call upon Jesus for his mercy and put all your hope for all your eternity in Jesus Christ and him alone and nothing else, guess what? Jesus will save you. Jesus will forgive you. Jesus will give you a place in heaven and take you to be with him, to live with him forever there. Amen. Let's pray. Amen.